Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you here this evening. Thanks so much for coming out. We're going to be looking at this metal man. It's a pretty impressive statue out there, isn't it? Uh, all the work that went into that, the carving, took uh, months to do, and then to be able to paint it and get something to cart it around. It represents something we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to go to the Bible. We're going to go to Daniel, the second chapter. Ron just talked about Daniel chapter 1. We're going to be talking about Daniel chapter 2 this evening. And since we're going to the Bible, since we're looking at spiritual topics, we want to invite the presence of God to help us understand what the scriptures say. So if you'll just take a moment to bow your heads with me and we'll invite God's spirit to be here to help us understand his book. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the great privilege we have of having a Bible today. Thank you for the men and women who uh, uh, took the time to make sure that through thick and thin, we have a Bible in our hands today. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be here to open our minds, to give us wisdom, and we thank you for hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's few of us would deny that we're living in a time of crisis in our world. We can see all kinds of saber rattling going on. We've got problems in the Middle East. China's a threat. Russia's got uh, uh, putting pressure. There's natural disasters happening around the world. Uh, sometimes it looks like a bomb goes off in certain parts of the world. But right here in America, tornadoes go through and it looks like a bomb has gone off here. And yet the United Nations, with all their abilities and all their leaders and all the brain trust that's there, trying to figure out what can we do about the great tremendous crises that we're facing in our world. And they don't really seem to be able to come up with any answers. The same problems that we've had for centuries, why, they're the same problems that we still have today. Is there something, is there somewhere that we can find hope and inspiration to be able to face the future unafraid? Has God revealed to us in any way what the future holds? Well, we're going to go to the book of Daniel this evening, Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to put the verses up here on the screen. And we're going to look at a dream, a dream that an ancient king had, a dream by the, na a dream by the name of, uh, uh, the gentleman's name was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had a tremendous dream, and we're going to find out about it because it gives us inspiration and tells us what's going to take place right at the end of time. So we'll start here in Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to look at the very first verse here. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1. There it says, And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and they stood before the king. So in the middle of the night, Nebuchadnezzar wakes up. His, his sleep breaks from him. It's like he's having a nightmare. This dream has a tremendous impact upon him. He calls all these men that he pays a good salary to, I'm sure, to help him understand the paranormal, to help him understand what the, what the gods, so to speak, are trying to tell him. What is the future going to hold? But as these gentlemen come in, they can't really tell the king what's going on because not only does the king want to know the interpretation of what he dreamed, he doesn't remember the dream either. And so here these, uh, these gentlemen ask, they said, And the king said unto them, I've dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever, tell thy servants the dream, and we will tell thee the interpretation. So just let us know what the dream is, king. We're in, we're in the, uh, the business of interpreting dreams. We're not in the business of telling what's going on inside your head. We can't see in there. So tell us the dream. We'll be happy to tell you what it means. But the king says, I don't remember. Verse 5 says, The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. So here Nebuchadnezzar is very serious. This dream has made a tremendous impact upon his life. He's up in the middle of the night. He's calling all these individuals in and he says, I want you to tell me 
not only what it interp the interpretation of the dream, I want you to tell me the dream itself. And so the Chaldeans and the soothsayers go back and forth with King Nebuchadnezzar trying to reason with him, saying, look, nobody asks that kind of a thing of these people. Nobody asks those, that kind of a request. Nebuchadnezzar finally gets fed up with them, and he says, look, if you can't tell me the dream, then out with you. And he sends them all out with the guards. He's going to cut them up in pieces, and their houses are going to be made a dunghill. Well, Daniel, who Ron just talked about here, was uh, classed with these individuals. God gave him wisdom, and he gave him uh, understanding and dreams and visions. And so Daniel was classed with these magicians and astrologers and soothsayers, etc. And so they went to Daniel's door in the middle of the night, knocked on his door, and Daniel wonders what's going on, and they tell him, come on, Daniel, we're going to cut you up in pieces and make your houses a dunghill. And so Daniel asks, well, why? It's the middle of the night. What's going on? Why is the decree so hasty from the king? And so he's told what's happened. He's told of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had that he can't remember. And so Daniel says, well, listen, let me go to the king. Give me a little bit of time. Let me go to the king. See if I can reason with him a little bit. He'll, maybe he'll give us a little bit of time and we'll tell him what the interpretation of his dream is. And so here now we find in verse 16 that Daniel goes in and he requests this time. Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Now, friends, that takes faith, doesn't it? Here you go in and say, listen, we'll tell you what your interpretation is, but you don't know what the dream is. You don't know what went on in, in the head of somebody else in the middle of the night. And so he goes back now and gathers some of his friends. They get down and they pray to the God of heaven who does know what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. In fact, he's the one who gives the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. As Daniel and his friends pray, God gives them understanding of what the dream is about and the interpretation along with that dream. And so we see here in verse 19, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So here God answers the prayers of his servant as their lives are on the line, as they're ready to be cut up in pieces, their houses be made a dunghill. God answers the prayer of his servants and shows them what the dream was and what the interpretation of the dream was. And Daniel praises the God of heaven. Notice now what he says in that time of praise. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he change, changeth the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So here's a clue now of what this dream that Nebuchadnezzar is going to have or has had that is what this uh, dream is about, where he removes kings and he sets up kings. And so we're going to find that this dream has to do with the rise and fall of kings, the rise and fall of empires. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast made known unto us the king's matter. And so Daniel is excited. He knows now what the dream is. He understands what the interpretation is. He's ready to go back to Nebuchadnezzar and help him understand what this dream is all about. And so he goes and he appears before the king. He tells the king that we know that the soothsayers, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, etc., they don't have the answers to what your dream is, nor its interpretation. And then in verse 28 he says, But there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. So not only do we know that this dream is about the rise and fall of kingdoms, but this dream also pertains to the very end of time. It's not just for Nebuchadnezzar, it's not just for the kingdom of Babylon, but it's also for the people living towards the end of time so they might understand what's going to take place at the end. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image 
The great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thigh of brass, his legs of iron and his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, so that no place was found for them, and that the stone which smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so Nebuchadnezzar, I imagine, is, is on the edge of his throne. He's wondering, wow, I, I remember all those things. I remember this statue. I remember seeing that in my dream. I remember the head of gold. I remember the, the arms and chest of silver, the belly and thigh of brass, the legs of iron, the feet part of iron and clay. I saw that stone coming down out of the sky and hitting the statue at the base of it. I remember as it exploded into a million pieces, the wind came along, blew it all away. I understand, Daniel, you can tell me what my dream is. You must know what the interpretation is all about. So what, Daniel, is this mean? What is it, this gold, silver, brass, iron, and feet of iron and clay? What does it all mean? And so Daniel now begins to tell him, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven has made thee a kingdom, given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given into thine hand, and made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And so Gabe, uh, pardon me, Daniel is, is uh, telling the king, here's what the dream means now. And he's talking to him about the head of gold, the first part of that statue, right at the very top. This head of gold is representative of you, Nebuchadnezzar. It's your kingdom, the golden kingdom of Babylon. That's what this head of gold means. And I imagine Nebuchadnezzar is just uh, uh, sitting up a little higher in his throne. There's a, there's a twinkle in his eye, a, a smile on his face as he recognizes, wow, this is about me. This is about my kingdom. This must be a glorious dream. This mu the future must be bright. But you remember, that dream was to go all the way for the latter days. And so Nebuchadnezzar possibly thought, my kingdom is going to go from one end of time to the other end of time. My kingdom is going to last forever. And he's feeling kind of just a little proud of himself because he had built Babylon. It was a beautiful, fabulous city. And so he thought his legacy would always be there. But Daniel, of course, is not finished with the dream yet, but he begins to tell Nebuchadnezzar, yes, Nebuchadnezzar, this head of gold is representative of you. And of course, Babylon was one of the richest kingdoms in the world. It had walls that were 87 feet thick. You could drive chariots on top of them. The walls were also about uh, two to 300 feet high, depending on which historian you consult. It was around 60 some odd miles in circumference. There was a river going through it. It actually had double walls. And so it was considered impregnable, a fabulous impregnable city. And so Nebuchadnezzar became the king there around 605 BC and he built up Nebuchadnezzar or built up Babylon to a golden kingdom. And to human eyes, it was impregnable. But Daniel now is going to move down to the arms and chest of silver. So we continue here reading in the next verse, in verse 39. And there it says, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar realizes that his kingdom, the golden kingdom of Babylon, is not going to last forever because once he dies, once he passes away, after you, Nebuchadnezzar, shall arise another kingdom, a different kingdom. Another kingdom shall arise, and it won't be as good as your kingdom. In fact, it's going to be inferior to yours. Just like 
Silver is inferior to gold. This next kingdom that's going to come after you is going to be inferior to thee. Well, of course, this was the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. They conquered Babylon around 539, 538 B.C. And God also foretold not only that another kingdom would come along and replace the kingdom of Babylon, but he tells us in the scripture who exactly was going to do that. So if we're going to go over to uh, Isaiah chapter 45, where God actually names the king that's going to take over and conquer Babylon. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 1. Here it says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. There's the name of the individual. The great Persian king, Cyrus the Great. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Now I want you to remember that phrase, I will loose the loins of kings. What phrase are you going to remember? I will loose the loins of kings. That right. And then he says, I'm going to open these gates before you. I'm going to open these two-leaved gates, and the gates will not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked, crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. I'm calling you my name, Cyrus. I'm going to give you this kingdom. I'm going to loose the loins of kings. I'm going to open to you the gates. Now, when we look at what happened and how the kingdom of Babylon fell, we'll see that these predictions were fulfilled. So we're going back now to the, uh, back now to the book of Daniel. And we find here, after Nebuchadnezzar passes away, and another king, and then his grandson is in power. And so here we find out that Cyrus has been named, and then it's 150 years before he is even born that Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 1 was written. God understands and sees the future. So now Belshazzar. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, when he had tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his wife, princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which was at Jerusalem, and the king and the princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. So here we see Belshazzar having this tremendous feast, this tremendous party, thousands of people coming to it. And as they're drinking the wine, as they begin to get drunk, they go to the, the temple of their God and they bring out the treasures of, from the temple of God at Israel. The temple of God at Jerusalem. Babylon had conquered Israel. They had taken out the golden vessels that were only uh, to be used in the sacred worship of God. They would brought them back to Babylon and they put them in the temple of their God. Well, now Belshazzar in this great feast, he's saying, I want to praise the gods of gold and silver. And so go and get these other vessels that we took out of the kingdom of, of Israel, out of the temple there at Israel. Go and bring those. Let's pour wine in them. Let's drink and we'll praise pagan gods. We'll praise pagan gods because these gods are superior to the God of the Jews. And the reason they're superior is because we conquered them. And so those vessels now are having wine filled in them and they're drinking and they're praising the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron, of wood and of stone. And as they begin to do this, as they drink the wine in those vessels, a hand comes. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. 
Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loose. Now what phrase did I ask you to remember? That he's going to loose the loins of kings. Well, here we have the fulfillment of this prophecy. So that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees began to smote one against another. Belshazzar is so terrified of this handwriting on the wall. It so impacts him, just like this dream was impacting Nebuchadnezzar as Daniel is explaining it to him, that he's so scared of what this writing has to, to be, uh, uh, the message behind this writing, that his knees are actually knocking together. And so Belshazzar does the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar did. He begins to call in the astrologers, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans, for to help him understand what do these words mean. And of course, as they all came in, they can't tell him what the words mean. They don't know what they're writing. So the queen mother, she comes in and she says, listen, Belshazzar, there's a man here. His name is Daniel. He understands hard sayings. He has, he has ideas and dreams and visions. Why don't you call him and he'll tell you what the interpretation is. So Daniel comes and he begins to talk to Belshazzar and he says, Belshazzar, here you are, praising the gods of gold and silver. You know better. You know what God has done to your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. You understand how the God of heaven took a, a tremendous power in his life. And even though you've known all this, here you are, praising the gods of gold and silver, lifting yourself up against the God of heaven. And now this writing is on the wall, and it has to deal specifically with you, Belshazzar. And so Daniel begins to interpret what these words mean. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and in whose all thy ways hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written, mine, mine, tikal, eupharsin. So Daniel says, this is what the writing says. These are the words, mine, mine, tikal, eupharsin. Well, Belshazzar's going, okay, that's the words, but I don't understand them. What do they mean? And so Daniel begins to interpret. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mine, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikal. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that very night, while D uh, Daniel is interpreting those words, while he's telling Belshazzar what the words mean, the kings of Cyrus, or the, pardon me, the kings of Persia and the Medes are coming to attack Babylon. Cyrus is one of them. He's the Persian king. Darius is the other one. He's the Median king. And they're outside the walls, but they're looking at these massive walls, two to 300 feet high, 87 feet thick. How is the conventional weaponry of the day going to get through those massive, massive walls? But there's a river running through there. There's the river Euphrates running, running under the city. And so they decide that they are going to be able to go under the wall if they can only lower the level of the water. And so they go back down the river, they dig a big ditch, and they divert the river over into a great plain. Slowly but surely, the river uh, level begins to go down, and they find as it goes down, there, there's gates there that the water actually goes through, but those gates have been left open. And so they begin to go under those uh, um, under the walls, through those gates, but as they get in, they find that there's other walls, double walls, but the gates have been left open. And what did God say to Cyrus? I will open before you the gates, fulfilling this prediction. You see, these guards that are uh, drinking wine and getting drunk have forgot to close the doors. And so now these armies of the Medes and Persians, of Cyrus and Darius, are beginning to go through those open gates at the very time that Daniel is interpreting those words. And they get into the city. And at one point, 
The Bible tells us in different places that one part of the city is being cried out and it's being taken. Another part of the city, there's war going on in that part of the city and finally it reaches the great ballroom where Belshazzar is and in that very night, we'll see here as we read on. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 30, In that night well was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. And so the Bible is very clear here what happened, that Babylon fell just exactly as God predicted that it would. The head of gold was replaced by the arms and chest of silver. So we're going back to chapter 2 now. Back to chapter 2, and we're going to look here again at verse 39, because here we see a third kingdom is going to come along. So Daniel chapter 2 and verse 39, we're now down into the arm, or pardon me, into the belly and thigh of brass. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. That's the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, the arms and chest of silver. And now we've got another third kingdom of brass, which will bear rule over all the earth. And of course, the kingdom that replaced the Medes and Persians is the kingdom of Greece. And the first great king of the Grecian Empire was Alexander the Great. And in eight short years, Alexander conquered the then known world. He went to war against Darius, uh, another king named Darius at the time. Darius had about 100 to 250,000 men. Alexander only had about 40,000 men. But his tactics were such that the uh, armies of Darius were scattered and eventually Alexander took the kingdom. Historians tell us this. I am persuaded that there was no city, no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding over his birth and his actions. And so here we see again the kingdom, the nation of the Grecian, or yes, the kingdom of Greece. And of course, at the Battle of Arbella, that's where Alexander defeated the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. Now we read on into the next, because now we're going from the belly and thigh of brass down into the legs of iron. Verse 40, and the fourth kingdom. So how many kingdoms have we had so far? We've had the head of gold, that's number one. We've had the arms and chest of silver, that's number two. We've had the third kingdom of brass, and now we're down into the fourth kingdom. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. So what's the great kingdom that comes after the Grecian Empire of Alexander? Anyone know their history? And we find out that at the Battle of Pydna, we see that it's the great Roman Empire. And here the historian Gibbon talks about this empire, and he notice he uses some of the same words right out of Daniel chapter 2 here as he describes the conquering power of Rome. It says that the images of gold, of silver, of brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. And so here, Rome is the one that comes next in power. It was Rome that was the... Uh, uh, in power in the time when Jesus came. Rome crucified our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Rome persecuted this Christian. Rome was the undisputed superpower of the world here. And again, there has only been four world kingdoms so far. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. There's only been four world kingdoms. There's not been five. In fact, if there had been five, we could take our Bibles, we could go out, we could we maybe place them in the trash. We would find out that, you know what, the Bible's just not accurate. There's been more than five world kingdoms. But the Bible is accurate, and there's not been more than four world empires. In fact, we're going to find that the last one here, the kingdom of Rome, is not going to be overpowered and taken over by another kingdom. Well, let's see what happens here. Let's take a look at what happens next. Verse 41 says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, so now we're down right there at the very bottom of the image, 
Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom, talking about the kingdom of Rome, shall be what? The kingdom's going to be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou saw iron mixed with clay. And so the kingdom here is not going to be overtaken. It's not going to be overpowered by another nation. It's going to be divided. Well, what happened to the kingdom of Rome? Well, over the course of time, it began to decay from within. It got too big for its britches. It couldn't police uh, all the way from Britain, all the way over past uh, into the Middle East and the top of Africa and most of Europe. It was just too big, too unwieldy to be able to um, control. And then it was decaying morally from the inside. And so along the northern part of Europe, these tribes began attacking, driving down into the southern part of, uh, well, into the northern part of, of uh, the kingdom of Rome, and it got divided. And this is what happened to Western Europe. Divided up into these uh, different separate kingdoms, the Visigoths here, the Ruoli, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, the Anglo-Saxons, the Frank, etc. And by 476 AD, historians tell us that Rome had been divided up into four, or pardon me, into ten separate kingdoms by 476 AD. Now, some of these kingdoms have become the modern nations of Europe that you and I know today. The Alamanni became the Germans, the Burgundians became the Swiss, the Franks became the French, the Lombards the Italians, the Anglo-Saxons the English, the Sway by the Portuguese, and the Visigoths became the Spanish. So seven of those tribes have made it to modern European nations that we see and know and understand today. Three of them, though, didn't make it through. They became extinct. Now, as we read verse 42, we're going to find out more detail about what goes on at the very bottom of the statue with the feet and toes of iron and clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And here we find this is exactly what we find in Europe today. There are some strong military and economic powers like France and Germany and England, and there are some weak economic and military powers like Portugal and Italy and Spain, just exactly like God predicted. And then we see in verse 43, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And so this Rome became divided. It became scattered. It became carved up. And they wanted to bring it back together again. They wanted to weld it into one power. And so it says here they're going to mingle themselves with the seed of men, trying to get them to stick together again, to become one empire. But God says they will not cleave one to another, just like iron and clay won't hold or stick together. And so if we go to, uh, to Europe, we find here Fredericksburg Castle. And in Fredericksburg Castle in Germany, or pardon me, in Denmark, we see King Frederick and Queen Diana noting uh, on this mural here, this family tree, known as the mother and father of Europe. The Bible says they were going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. They were going to try to intermarriage, and through those marriage alliances, they were going to seek to weld Europe to stick back together again to be one and to solve the problem of war going on there. But it didn't work out, of course, because the Bible tells us that they are not going to cleave one to another. And most of these family alliances, they ended up having quarrels among themselves, family quarrels that uh, rose and rose and got worse and worse until war broke out. And so over the course of history, they tried to win it back as one power again through war as well. And so in the 800s, we have uh, Charlemagne trying to weld Europe back together again. Of course, it didn't work. And then we have Charles V in the 1500s trying to put the nation of Europe back together again. It did not work either. And then we have Louis XIV in the late 1600s trying to do what he could to bring Europe back together again. 
it failed as well. And then we have in the late 17, early 1800s, we have Napoleon trying to put Europe together again. Notice he says, I want to found a European system, a European court of law, a European court of appeals. It was his desire to weld Europe back together again and have a one Europe with one set of laws, one set of court of appeals. That was Napoleon's dream. That was his purpose from the beginning. However, the Bible tells us they're not going to cleave one to another. And he almost made it. He almost did it. But as he went to Russia to try to conquer Russia, there was this huge, severe winter, and he lost thousands, hundreds of thousands of men trying to go to conquer Russia and then coming back. And so many historians tell us that it wasn't the Russians, it wasn't the Germans, it wasn't warfare that broke down the armies, but it was the weather, God, General January, General February. And so notice the historian here. The deliverance of Europe from the dominion of Napoleon was effected neither by Russia, nor by Germany, nor by England, but by the hand of God alone. For what had the Bible said? They shall not cleave one to another. Everyone who tries to put it back together again has to go up against the word of God, which says they're not going to cleave one to another. Well, then we have come down to uh, World War I. We have Kaiser Wilhelm who tried to put uh, Europe back together, but again, it did not work. And then we have this gentleman, Adolf Hitler, who tried to put Europe back together again. He, too, almost succeeded. There was only England that was left. He took over France. He took over Germany. He took over Austria, and Italy was on his side. Oh, Europe was, was under his command. England was left. It was vastly superior in arms. They weren't prepared for war. They didn't have the trained troops that the polished army of Hitler had. And yet, the Bible tells us, they shall not cleave one to another. It didn't work with them either. And so it didn't work with all these individuals that tried to put these things together. The Bible can be trusted. It is accurate and it cannot fail. But they're still trying to do it. They haven't learned the lesson. They're still trying to put Europe together even today. They're not trying to do it through intermarriage anymore. They're not trying to do it through military anymore. They're now trying finances. They're now trying the euro, one European currency. They're trying to get the rest of Europe to give up the pound sterling, to give up the franc, to give up the other currencies and have just one currency. But now we're finding out that uh, nations don't want to do that anymore. They don't want to be, have a European court of appeals like Napoleon said. They don't want to have one law over all of Europe. They want to decide their own destiny and be responsible for their own finances. And so we're seeing pushback against, uh, against the idea of a united Europe. And here the battle of Europe has begun. The European elections that are going to happen uh, tomorrow, I believe. You have Gert Wilder here, the gentleman on uh, your far that side, uh, <clears throat> who is there from, uh, from the Netherlands. And Marine Le Pen there, she's from France in the middle, and other leaders of Europe, they're saying, no, we don't want this European Union. We want to have our own destiny in our own hands. And then you have this gentleman here, Nigel Farage. He's the, uh, Farage, he's the head of the Brexit party, and he wants out of Europe completely. Listen to what he has to say here about his idea of being told from Brussels what to do. Look, all over Europe, what you are seeing is the growth of real opposition to this project. The idea that Europe's laws should be set and made by a group of unelected old men in Brussels, it's an idea whose time has passed. And I, I don't just want the UK out of the European Union, I want Europe out of the European Union. I want a Europe of sovereign democratic states working and trading closely together, but this current system will not stand the test of time, believe you me. And so Nigel Farage is saying, 
it's not going to work. It's not going to stand the test of time because it's not going to stand the test of the Bible. It says they shall not cleave one to another. And his ideas of having a, a, a broken Europe with all the little countries deciding their own financial destiny is fine by him. That's what he wants. That's in harmony with what the scripture says are going to take place at the end of time. They shall not cleave one to another. There's going to be a breakup and a pushback from having this united Europe. But not only are they trying to gain it through elections and through finances, they're also trying to weld Europe back together based on religion. Notice here, this is from a former ambassador to the U.S. from Lebanon. The only hope for the Western world lies in an alliance between the Roman Catholic Church, which is the most commonly influential, controlling, unifying element in Europe, and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Rome must unite with Eastern Orthodoxy because the Eastern Orthodox Church controls the Western Middle East, which is the eastern end of the Mediterranean Ocean. And if it, they do not solidify that control, Islam will march across Europe. Islam is political. So the only hope for the Western world lies then in a united Europe under the control of the Pope. And so here we see what's going to unite Europe is religion. The only hope for Europe, he says, is a united Europe under the control of the Pope. And so Cardinal Burke here says the church is really, really should be afraid of Islam. Here now you have competing religions that are vying for and trying for control of Europe. And here's some uh, union leader in Europe saying, yes, we need to try and coalesce Europe. And notice he's doing it under a religious symbol. Listen to what he has to say. Do we really want to live without a Sunday? without a day where we don't work. Many workers nowadays don't have a choice with all the consequences for their families and their private life at large. Uni Europa, the European Services Workers Union, demands of the new European Parliament and the new European Commission to make a difference, to have legislation that people do not need to work on Sundays. Get involved, send in your video messages and your picture messages. Let's keep Sunday special for all of us. And so here we see this union leader saying, look at, let's demand of the European Union to put legislation in where uh, this uh, religious symbol of Sunday here is enforced. And so here we see religion also being used to say, let's unite Europe. But again, what does the Bible say? They shall not cleave one to another. So what's going to happen next? Here we are down in 2019. As we see, they're still trying to put Europe back together again. What's the next thing that's going to take place? Well, let's read on now in verse 44. And it says there, And in the days of these kings... And in the time of these broken kingdoms, this broken kingdom of Rome, as they're trying to put things together again, in the days of these things shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever." For as much as thou sawest that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. And so here we see at the end of time, in the latter days, this dream was for Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar. And at the very end, down in the feet, of toes, uh, feet and toes of iron and of clay, when they're trying to put Europe back together again, at that time, in the days of these kings, at the time that this is going on, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. And so what's this stone? What is this talking about here? What does this have to do with the setting up of the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus referred to this stone coming as he talked to the religious leaders in the book of Matthew. And so we want to look there for a moment. Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to see that 
this uh, stone here that hits at the very end is referred to here in Matthew chapter 21. There it says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And now notice what he says to these religious leaders. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. That's the exact imagery we see there in the book of Daniel, where this stone comes, hits the image on its feet, breaks it into a million little pieces. The wind comes, blows it away. And Daniel is saying that the stone that comes, hits the image, really is talking about the kingdom of God being set up and breaking and consuming all the kingdoms of earth. And Jesus is saying, that that stone that comes is going to grind to powder just like the stone in Daniel chapter 2, going to grind the kingdoms of earth to powder. So how do we avoid that stone hitting us? How do we avoid having that stone grind us to powder? Jesus tells us here in this verse, whosoever falls on the rock, whosoever falls on the stone shall be broken. That's the way to avoid having the stone fall on you. You fall on the stone rather than having the stone fall upon you. So what does this mean? What did Jesus mean when he referred to falling on the rock? When we realize that without Jesus Christ, we're lost human beings, that our sins have separated us from God, and that the wages of sin is death, that we are going to be lost individuals unless we can find forgiveness, unless we can find cleansing, unless our sins and our guilt can be taked away, taken away, unless we can stand before God clean, unless he can look upon us and say, you are uh, safe to save. And so as we confess our sins to Jesus Christ, as we ask him to take away our sins, he grants us the gift of forgiveness because of the death of Jesus Christ. He takes away and washes us from our sins so that we stand before him clean, just as if we'd never sinned, pure and holy in his sight because of the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away our sins. When we say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want my sins to be forgiven. I want to have my sins washed away. I want to follow the scriptures. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Christ. That's falling on the rock, Jesus Christ, and being broken. If we will do that, when Jesus comes again and sets up his kingdom, we'll be a part of that kingdom. The stone that comes and breaks up all the kingdoms of the world will not fall upon us because we've fallen on that rock and we're going to be a part of that kingdom that grows and becomes a part of the whole earth. Let's take a moment here to just pray together and ask God to do that for us, to wash us from our sins, that we might be a part of that kingdom that is very soon to come. Let's bow our heads together. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for this dream, this vision that Nebuchadnezzar had that tells us what's going to take place in the latter days. As we see these things happening, as they're trying to put Europe together again, as they've tried many times in the past and you've said they are not going to cleave together and that when they're trying to do it, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. Father, we want to be a part of that kingdom. And we ask just now that you would forgive us of our sins. We confess our sins to you and ask that you would take them away, that they would be borne by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we would be washed from them, that our guilt would be removed, and that we might become your children, followers of Jesus Christ. Perhaps there's some here this evening who haven't taken that step. Lord, I pray now in their own hearts and minds, in your own heart and mind here, just say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. If you've never studied the Bible before and you want to take opportunity to see what this book teaches, make that decision right now just in your own heart and mind and say, Father, help me to understand your word, and God will. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for your kindness and your love to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.
For those of you who have come this evening, we have a gift we'd like to hand out to you. And so as you, uh, as you leave tonight, maybe you can, where, where is it, by the way? Are, you right, are they right here in front? Yes, come. And uh, if you're here new this evening, uh, we've got a little gift we'd like to hand out to you. So please, please come. It's a nice little book inside here, and we'd like to give one to you. So thanks again for coming. And uh, please come and grab your gift here. Thank you so much for being with us tonight.